chapter 20. Um, just a quick announcement. I will try to post a message to this effect on the group as well. Uh, we, we will not have class next Wednesday. Right? We will have class this Sunday evening. Um, on Sunday, Sunday night, we'll, we'll have probably another Matthew class, but like I said, I'm still praying about uh, something else to fill this gap. But the next week, it's our missions conference week, so we're not going to have uh, Bible school on Wednesday. We're not going to have midweek service. We're just going to let you guys rest and get refreshed and then have you there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So just so that you know, next week we'll, we'll be off. All right, Matthew 20, and if I could introduce the chapter in this way. To say exaltation through service. And I'm. The, it's amazing every time I teach through a particular book, how much more the Lord teaches me through it. I, you know, last time I taught through, I, I tried to scour the depths of it and get everything I could. And then there's just more and more. But the more I look at Matthew, the more I see him talking about service and the purpose of it. And on the heels of what Peter has just asked, what do we get out of it? Now Jesus is going to answer with this parable to say, now be careful about your motives here. Because I'm glad you've given everything up to serve me. But just because you've made that one sacrifice doesn't mean your heart is forever protected from having bad intentions and bad motives. And uh, keeping in mind that whole looking for an opportunity to serve and trying to do this with humility and not trying to compare with other people and become something great. Just serve. Just be a servant. Which is fascinating because the Gospel of Matthew presents Jesus as the king. But the king comes to serve. It, it's, it's interesting how that works out in this book. All right, but chapter 20, exaltation through service. So verses 1 to 16, the 11th hour. That's a good name for this parable. Verses 17 to 19, the end of Jesus' life, that is, he's foretelling about it. Verses 20 to 29, elevation of ministers. And then verses 30 to 34, eye-opening experience. We'll talk about blind men getting their sight. <clears throat> so chapter 20 and verse 1. First word, for. Guys, when the Bible was written, it did not have chapter markings. It did not have verse markings. So the chapters came in in the 1200s. The verse markings came in in the 1500s. So it's, it's good sometimes to read this as one continuous story. Now, the chapters and verses, they get broken up because there are logical places within the, within the text where you can see this happened and then there's a break in the story and it goes on to something else. But in this particular case, Jesus is, I, I think he's continuing on the conversation. What do we get since we forsook all and followed you. You get this and this and this. The last are first. First are last. Okay, good. But, Peter, keep listening. Because there's something that you need to know about about this reward you're going to get. So he's going to explain it further. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. All right, so this man that's going out to hire laborers I think we can easily see this as, as God or even Christ, which is, of course, one and the same. But I, I think that's uh, either way, the, the one in charge of the vineyard. And I think you, it's also legitimate to understand this in two ways. I'm going to say them so that I don't have to repeat it all the way through. You can view this dispensationally and think God has gone out and hired laborers. People have served him in the early days of the church, right? 100, 200 AD, and then in 500, and then in 1000 AD, 1500, and all throughout church history, people have joined the battle, okay? And, and, and you can say, well, the people in the first part of the church age had it a lot more difficult than we do now. So maybe you can see it like that. You can also see it, however, in a generational sense. That is to say, somebody gets saved at the age of 10, and they serve in a youth capacity. And then as they get older, they serve in a different capacity. And then all throughout their life, until they're 90, they're in the service of Christ. Right? That's, that's the guy who got hired in the first hour. But then you get some people, they get saved at the age of 65 or 70. We had a gentleman get saved 
two weeks ago. He's 74 years old. He, now he's saved. He's getting excited. He wants to serve the Lord. That's an 11th hour. That's like 11 hours and 59 minutes. I mean, that's, you're really pushing it when you wait that long, right? But so how, how is God going to reward that guy that got saved late in life and did not have time to do as much as the first guy, right? That's what this parable, I think, is meant to, to tackle. So you can view it in a broader sense, like in a dispensational way, but I, I think probably we're looking at that second application. Verse 2, And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Now, by the way, this is where we allow the Bible to tell us that one penny equals a day's wage. And then we use this in all the other parables. And remember Matthew 18, a right, hundred pence, that's a hundred pennies and that kind of thing. All right, so a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. All right, so just count time like a Jew for a moment. The day starts at 6 a.m., right, not midnight. 6 a.m., that's the beginning of the day. The first people are hired. And then he's, he goes out at 9. Do I have that timing right? Yeah, third hour. So he goes out at 9 a.m., and he sees there's still some people that don't have a job. They're just standing around. Uh, verse 4, he said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Now, just notice the difference. The first group, I'll give you a penny a day. Right? One day's work, a penny. The other group, I'll give you what is right. He didn't say a penny. He just said what is right. So that's a bit of a trust thing there to say, okay, I'll, I'll let you decide what I'm worth by the end of the day. Verse uh, 5, again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. So that's 12 o'clock noon, 3 p.m. Verse 6, and about the eleventh hour, so this will be 5 p.m. He went out and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? Now, I'm not going to do it, but that's a great verse for preaching, right? You know, I mean, what, what a verse just, that, that's, what, that's somebody throwing a slow ball over the, you can just knock it out for six there, because that's, so many people are standing slash sitting around in the church doing nothing. The, the most that they do for the church is warm the seat. <laughs> and that, that's it. That's their contribution is just a seat warmer. All right, so enough of the preaching. Verse 7, And they say unto him, Because no man hath hired us, he saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So, when even was come, for a Jew, the evening starts at 6 p.m. So the last group, and you can do the math, 11th hour, they work one hour, that's it. So when the even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward. A steward is a business manager. He's the one that takes care of the money for the, uh, for the Lord of the vineyard. Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. So do you see how this connects to what Jesus just told Peter? The last shall be first, the first shall be last. So if you're Peter or any of the apostles listening to this, you're going, oh, wait, okay, I, I get it. He's teaching us further about what he just said. Now, verse number um, 9. And when they came that were hired about the 11th hour, they received every man a penny. They worked one hour. They got paid for 12. Now, j j put yourself in the story. If you're the guy that worked all 12 hours and you are watching the guy that got one, hours of work, one hour of work in and got a penny, you know what you're thinking? Woo, bonus time, baby. I'm going to get paid like double time for overtime, right? Because if he gets a penny, I'm looking at what? I'm, if I'm that guy, I'm planning out a vacation. <laughs> I mean, that's, I could take a few days off, take the wife to the coast. I mean, it's something, right? So I'm about to get 12 pennies. That's what I would be, or at least possibly, thinking. Verse number 10, But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. So here's, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Just so deflating. Now, you know what you're reading here? This, this is the judgment seat of Christ. You get that right. This is the judgment seat of Christ, because it's a public thing. 
That's what I'm learning here. Not, I get to watch your judgment. You get to watch mine. And here's the gold, silver, and precious stone, the wood, hay, and stubble. And this burns up and that doesn't. And then people are standing there going, oh, now, oh, okay, now if he got in and he just a little bit of this, little bit, and he got this crown and that crown, whoo, boy. I'm, and then their turn comes and Jesus says, all right, let's take a look. It, th- this shows you something. The church, and, and might I say the body of Christ, not just the local church, although it's true in this category, the body of Christ is not a business. You did not sign a contract with the Lord that says 12 hours equals one penny, right? Not everybody has that contract. Now, God will honor his word. What did, what did the Lord tell in verse 2? What did he tell those first laborers? Work 12 hours, get a penny. Is that what he did for him? Yep. God is going to honor his word. What did he tell the other guys? Whatever's right. Now, God left that open. So you, you got to be careful not to go at this to say, okay, God is going to give me what I expect. Brother Welder gave me some great advice when he was here a couple of years ago. Take all your expectations and throw them away. <laughs> God does not work based on your expectations. God will reward as he sees fit. And there's more to the situation than just how many hours you put in. That's how your boss might pay you. You work this many hours, you get this much money. But God knows much more about your service than just how many hours you put in. We can cheat the boss by clocking in and clocking out at whatever time, but what are we doing in between? The boss may not know, but God knows. And God knows what the heart is doing while you're hands are doing what it, God knows so much better how to properly reward that individual servant for what he did with the time with the opportunities he had you're going to find some people from Papua New Guinea that never had a full set of clothes never wore shoes never tasted a toothbrush never learned how to read but a missionary showed up and preached Jesus and got saved And every day would go to the missionary's house and listen to the word of God. And he'd go home and treat his wife right. And he'd stop beating his neighbors and stealing their chickens. And and all of a sudden, this man's life is transformed. And he doesn't win a a bunch of people. He just, he wins his neighbors to Christ. And you and I would look at it and go, well, you know, little villager out in the backside of the jungle. I mean, okay, maybe half a penny. The Lord looks down and says, that guy was looking for any way to serve me. And every time he heard something from the, missionary, uh, the missionary's sermon, he went home and then he applied it. And he may not have had as many opportunities. He didn't have as much to work with, but boy, he made the most of what he had. And then here we are with an embarrassment of riches. Bible upon Bible upon Bible. I mean, lesson after lesson, sermon after sermon. We'll go out. We'll go to the mission. We'll... But then we sit back and go, eh, well, maybe one day I'll get involved. Yeah, I'm busy. I got, you know, I'm vacation. I got some family to, and we just, I pray that you have me excused. I pray that you have, and God looks at that and says, okay, now, if we're just looking at quantity, this guy beats this guy. But if we're looking at quality, then I got to reward it this way. See, so God looks at this differently than, than we do. The body of Christ is not a business. Don't treat it like that. So he says in verse number 11, and when they had received it, uh, they murmured against the goodman of the house. They got upset with the, with the Lord, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us. I can hear Gen Z crying out, Equity. We want equality of outcome, right? <laughs> and the, the Lord doesn't work like that. Thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Notice what the Lord does. He says, let's talk about the agreement I made with you. Let's not talk about what your brother did and the agreement I had with him. He, he and I, now, guys, we know that the, the general expectations that we have from the Lord apply to everybody, right? Discipleship requires full commitment, that, that type of thing. But there are many particulars and specifics that go into everybody's story. And what you need to be worried about is your walk with the Lord, your service. This idea, and I've heard this so many times, well, you know, so-and-so, they don't come to church at all. I come to church more than them. What? 
how, when did that become the standard for how much we go to church? Or, you know, I witness this much, and I know a lot of people that never even do it. What, what does that got to do with it? It doesn't matter how much they do it. How much does the Lord want you to do it? Well, I was growing up, my mom and dad never prayed with me ever. You know, I pray with my kids once a month. It doesn't matter what your mom and dad did. How much does the Lord want you involved with your kids? Right, so in every facet, 2 Corinthians 10, you guys know this verse, verse 12? Let's take a look, let's take a look. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. And I, I truly think that's what, this is the concept that the Lord is trying to teach his disciples here. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12. Paul says, for we dare not make ourselves of the number. We're not trying to make a top 10 list. That's of no use. Or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. They think they did a good job. Based on what? Their own expectations that they created in their own mind. I think this is enough. I think this is enough service, enough Bible, enough prayer, whatever category you want to put. And then he goes on to say, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. They're, they're not judging this properly because your brother or sister is not the standard. What did Jesus tell you to do? What did he tell you to do today? What were the expectations today from your master, not from your brother? So we, we get sometimes a false sense of accomplishment and a false sense of security because we outdid someone else. But to, to the Lord, that, that is a, a false standard. So come back to Matthew 20, verse 13. I'm sorry, we read verse 13. Verse 14, take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto this last even as unto thee. Now, again, why would it be okay for him to do that? Because he's not rewarding, or in this case, paying them based on time, rather the quality of, of the work. This guy worked extremely hard in that one hour he had, right? And, and he was, he's worth, in, in the Lord's mind, he's worth that penny. And the Lord's allowed to do that. It's, it's his money to pay. So if he wants to hand out that crown or that inheritance, the Lord is capable of judging that. Verse 15, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Well, yes, it, it is. It's his own money to pay. Now, this, is, this doesn't mean that God, okay, can I say it like this? God is just, he is fair, right? He is never going to um, cheat or, or ignore good behavior and not reward it accordingly. The Lord is fair in that way. But again, we have to be careful not to insert our own standards of fair to that. Say, well, I think this is fair. God is allowed to reward and bless as he sees fit. And then at the end of verse 15, is thine eye evil because I am good? That's very interesting. All the way back to Matthew 6. We, we learned this in Matthew 6. The evil eye is greed. Now he's saying, are, are, have you become greedy because I am good? So what happened here? The guy that started at the beginning of the day, he's standing back watching the 11th hour guy get paid. What did he learn at that moment? Man, this master, this, this Lord of the vineyard, he's a really good guy. Look at how well he paid the guy for just one hour's work. So the goodness of God makes, the, makes this guy standing back go, okay, wow, I'm really going to get a lot. And the greed kicks in right away. And he says, wow, if he's going to bless him like that, I'm going to be blessed abundantly. And now his heart, his desire is not on, he's not thinking about, I had the privilege of helping this Lord, helping this, the, the master of the vineyard. That's no, that's no longer his motive. Now all he's thinking about is how much do I get out of this? And it, it becomes a, a pride and prestige and I've done this much work, therefore I deserve this title, I deserve this much recognition, and if you would allow this guy and that guy to have those things, then I should be careful. That, that's why I've tried to title it like this. God is exalting you and rewarding you just by letting you labor in his vineyard. That's the reward in and of itself. The fact that he would give you anything like a crown, 
like an inheritance, like the privilege of ruling. You don't deserve that. Even if you serve him, follow him, forsake all, you, you, that was the least you could do after what he did for, for us, right? Uh, look at Luke chapter 17. Listen, guys, do what's right because it's right to do. And be very careful about ambition and setting your own expectations. Well, if, if I do this and say this and if I'm faithful for so long, then surely within the church or within the body of Christ, surely God is going to let me do these. Sometimes people try to climb that spiritual ladder and say, well, if, if I do this and this and this, I'm guaranteed to have a spot in the ministry. No, you're not. God never said that if you go to Bible school, you'll be a pastor. Yo, in Malawi, we had to really work that through people because missionaries for decades, they, sh they set up the, the mission school. People go through and they promise them, once you graduate, we'll give you a job. You will be a pastor. We will give you a church. And they do. They take them to the village, build them a building, and they tell the people, this is your pastor. I, that, that is just not how the ministry was meant to work. You can do everything perfectly right and not get called into the ministry. We, we touched on it Sunday night. Be happy as a Tychicus, right? If God lets you be a Paul, praise the Lord. If he doesn't, then be something else. <laughs> Just work in his vineyard at whatever capacity. Whenever I uh, moved to South Africa, this is oh, about a year and a half after I moved, I, I really went through a valley my faith was tested because, I, I, I don't know, I don't know if it was my flesh or the devil or what, but I had it in my head that God had demoted me. And it hurt. It took a while to get through that. Because I thought, Lord, in Malawi, it's not like things were going poorly. We had a thriving ministry. <laughs> I, I was preaching on national radio every, every week. I was the head of the national basketball team. I was on national TV doing interviews in English and Chichewa. I had people running up to me on the streets going, are you the white man who speaks our language? Yes, ah, speak it, <laughs> speak it. And then I would just preach the gospel. I could, I could go anywhere in town and, and conversations, I mean, I'm not joking, hundreds of people would come around and we could, pre the, 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 the possibilities are just endless, it seemed. And then God said, leave that, come down here. And I got here, and I thought, okay, Lord. Well, when I got here, I thought, well, let's, let's see. Let's keep things going, because we had churches opening and men graduating from Bible school and people wanting the gospel. Guys, I had a stack of letters this high on my desk in Malawi from villages saying, please bring a church. Please bring a pastor. We want... Whew. And then I got here, and... We, I mean, somebody hit the brakes. And at the red light, and okay... We're not, churches aren't popping up, and we go out to preach, and there's not 100 people gathering. I'm like, ah, and Afrikaans doesn't come out of my mouth the same way Chichewa did. And I'm just thinking, man, Lord, I felt like a missionary there. And here I feel just like a pastor. Now, now I'm not saying I was, I'm right. I'm just saying that's, I'm telling you what I thought. I thought, God, you demoted me. You took me out of something that was really rolling well. And, and now, to do what? To do what? <laughs> and God had to work on me. Say, Mike, you don't, I never promised you results. I never even promised you a, a spot in the ministry. You, you said that you would obey. That was the deal. Back in Bible school, that was the deal. Lord, whatever you tell me to do. If you want me to go scrub some church's toilets for the rest of my life, whatever. I, I, he said, you remember that? I said, I remember that, Lord. He said, well, then you're doing pretty good, aren't you? Because <laughs> we had a deacon to do that. <laughs> I said, all right, Lord, whatever you want. Now, you know what I've seen, right, as time goes on? This is just the slower approach. But, man, a lot's getting done. And it's a lot that I, I mean, it's not as if I'm doing it even. It's just trying to do what he told me to do, and then God brings this guy, God brings this girl, and then more and more people come, and then all of a sudden they start going out as missionaries, and then a church pops up on the coast, and then all of a sudden more people come and say, oh, I want, 
We're not done yet, right? So maybe it wasn't a demotion. But even if it was, what's a demotion? Right? What, what's a de- I wasn't in it for the name tag. Missionary or pastor, servant. Servant. I, I get to do something. That's all, that he, that's all that I asked for, and that's more than I deserve. All right, Luke 17. I'm trailing off into testimony here. Luke 17, verse, uh, oh, let's get verse 7. Luke 17, 7. But which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet? Well, you don't do that. He's your servant. He's there to serve. He's not there to get fed. Verse 8, and will not rather say to, uh, unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup and gird thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Well, that's typical life. That's, that's right. He's the servant. That's what he's paid to do. Verse 9, doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. means I, of course not. He doesn't run over to him and go, thank you so much. You did your job. That's a 21st century Gen Z pampering, pandering kind of, oh, 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 hey, you breathed. Well done. Well done. You're a winner. Verse 10, so likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are what? What kind of servants? Unprofitable Unprofitable servants. Why? We have done that which was our duty to do. So so watch this. He gave you duty, right? That's the expectation. He gave you the duty. You did it. That balances out. If you want to profit him, you would go above and beyond the duty. Right? But to, to do, just to do what you were told to do, even if you were told to do something big, like go outside, work all day, then come in and cook. You go, whew, that's a big day. Well, that's what you were told to do. So to just do that, you squared the account. All right, back to Matthew 20 now. Verse 16. Matthew 20 and 16. So the last shall be first. And the first, last. Uh, So Jesus has actually turned it around. If you compare it with 1930, many that are first shall be last. And this time, the last shall be first and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. So now, Jesus is using that same phrase, but in a completely different way. In chapter 19, the point was this. There are people that in this life put themselves first. It's all about how much money they can make and time with family and friends. It's all about them. Okay, they're going to be last. They may not even make it into the kingdom, that type of thing. Very broad. The rich guy doesn't give up the possessions. The first in in this life, last in the next. Okay, but now in chapter 20, verse 16, we're talking about the ones that have been laboring for the master. And this same concept is given to the servants. And, and the guy that was last shall be first. The guy that was an unknown Tychicus, just serving in a Phoebe, serving the church, running a message here and there. They get to the kingdom, but because they did it with all their heart, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. That guy that only had one hour, right, the tail end of his life, but boy, did he give it his all. We would think of him as, who is he? That's the guy Jesus can trust because he did as much as he could with what he had and even exceeded expectation, perhaps. And then the guy that walks into the kingdom going, okay, boy, I tell you what, I fulfilled the will of God and then some. Boy, I preached and let him have it. I opened a church and built it big and painted it pretty and wow, God, did you read my autobiography, God? Tell you what, I put you all throughout that book. And God says, I'm sorry, who are you again? I'm pastor so-and-so. Oh, we got a section for you guys. Arrogant preachers sit over there in the kingdom doing nothing. <laughs> and that guy who thought, he said, but, but I'm called. God, you gave me a calling. Yes, but you didn't perform it for the right reasons. So you are not chosen to reign alongside Christ in that kingdom. So yes, you were called, you were invited, but you didn't make good on that. 
you were in it for the wrong reasons. So this becomes more of a lesson about how to serve, not how to be saved. All right, so you can see how Jesus, man, he's versatile with his sayings. He can take his same phrase and, and make it applicable in so many different ways. Verse 17, And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. Now, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 18, the disciples didn't understand this. And therefore, look at their response, which is non-existent. They said nothing. This is the third time he's told them this. But look at this progression. Chapter 16, when he first said it in verse 21, Peter rebuked him and said, No, no, Lord, we're not going to let you die. Okay, so, I mean, he was very much engaged. Not going to let that happen. Okay. And then the next time Jesus said it, chapter 17, verse 22, 23, they shall kill him. Look at what it says at the end. And they were exceeding sorry. Do you see that? So the first time, no, Lord, we're going to stand for you. Next time, I'm going to die. So I'm going to rise again. Aw. They're just sorry. But now this time he says it again. I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again. And what, what's their response? Nothing. This tells me something. The, the more we hear the story of the cross, we're in danger of getting numb to it. When we first hear it, what? You're going to die? Oh, mm, how can that be? Next time we hear it, oh, shame. We hear it again? Eh, I've heard that before. <laughs> now, in this case, let, let's give them a little credit. It's, it's not that they shrugged it off that they didn't care. They just didn't understand. They, they, they were trying to wrap their heads around, how can the Messiah die? He's supposed to conquer, not suffer. And that was just a, a strange concept to them. All right, verse 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons. So um, James and John, they are the two sons here. I, I think Salome, if I'm not mistaken, was this lady's name. But they come and uh, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. So in, in one gospel, you see it's the mother. In the other gospel, it's James and John. They all came together. None of the gospels are wrong on that. They were all in on this at the same time. Verse 21, and, and he said unto her, What wilt thou? What, how can I help? What do you want? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. I tell you what, Jesus is just dealing with this issue. This goes all the way back to chapter 18. Who shall be the greatest? Jesus has already taught on this. And now these boys are still trying to say, hey, Jesus, you know, we've stuck with you through thick and thin. We are the sons of thunder. <laughs> right hand, left hand, you know what they're after? We want this big position in the kingdom. We want to have this prestige. We want to be recognized. It's the wrong attitude for service. You, you, you stop looking at what you're going to get out of this. Just be happy to serve. Verse 22, but Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. And they truly didn't. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? Now, that's future tense, right? And to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? So Jesus is pointing to a future time. He's already been baptized in water, right? So he's not pointing to that. And, and obviously, I mean, what kind of question would that be for him, right? You, you want the high position in the kingdom? Can you get in the water? I mean, that's kind of a silly, silly question or silly answer. But, he, but he's asking them, are you guys ready to suffer? And they knew that. They understood this, this metaphor, if you will, this language. They say unto him, we are able. And he saith unto them, ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. It almost makes it sound as if Jesus is already, the suffering has already started. And, and you can see that in how much he's talking about, I'm going to go die, they're going to crucify, then I'm going to rise. It's on his mind, and his heart is already starting to break because he knows what sinners are going to do to him. And he says, now, now you guys are also going to go through this. You, you will be persecuted. People will hate you for doing the will of God. So I know that you can accomplish that. Interestingly enough, James is the first apostle to die. Now, I'm excluding Judas, okay? 
James is the first one to die a martyr's death in, in Acts chapter 12, and John, his brother, is the last of the apostles to die. So they kind of sandwich all of the apostles in that. He says, But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. Now, forgive just the, I'm going to say an educated guess, a biblical guess. I would say Moses and Elijah would probably be the right and the left hand, I, I'm guessing. But whoever it is, of course, the Father's going to decide. Verse 24, And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. So this ambition, this, can we call it, frustrated ambition. We want these positions. You know, and now what happens? Internally, within the church, because that's what it was at this time, they start fussing and fighting with each other. What does it turn into? You're not worthy of that position. What makes you think you could sit at his right hand? What do you think you've done? I, you know how this goes, because we do it too, right? The, I mean, all flesh is grass, and the grass still grows even now in 2024. And we say, but you did that. But what have I done? Look at what I've done. And we, we get right back to comparing them among ourselves. So this is something. <laughs> flip over to Luke 22 real quick. Let me show you how, how deep this goes. You folks agree with me that this conversation Jesus is having with those men, that's not the first time he's talked about that, right, with them. He said, guys, stop worrying about who's greatest. Serve. Look for the little ones, right? We, we've gone through this. So now he's going through it again. But look at Luke 22, verse, uh, look at verse 21. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they begin to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. What is this? What, what, what's happening here? What time? What, what's, what's the event? The table. The Lord's Supper. The Last Supper. Right? You know that's hours away from Jesus dying. Look at verse 24. And there was also a strife among them which of them should be accounted the greatest. Serious, guys? I mean, we're not even a day away from Jesus dying. Hey, I think I'm going to sit next to him and think, I mean, guys, you've, you're missing the point. Let's come back to chapter 20. Verse 25, But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. So he says, you guys know how the world does it. They're all about pride, prestige, recognition, barking out commands, and yet not doing any of that themselves. They're not. The bosses, the owners, they're not interested in serving the people. They want the people to serve them. He says, now guys, that's not how we're going to do it. In verse number 26, but it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And this, I think the best illustration of this is Jesus, interestingly enough, at the Last Supper, girding on a towel and washing their feet. So all the way to the end, and perhaps he was answering their argument about who would be the greatest, right? Because we just saw that's when they were arguing about it. Guys, if you want to know who the greatest is, I'm your Lord and Master. Watch, towel, dirty feet. I'm the top of the list, but I'm putting myself down, down here. He says, let him be your minister. Verse 27, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. And then where do we learn this from? What's the example? Verse 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. What's the greatest honor you can receive? Not the right and left hand in the kingdom, but getting to give yourself on the behalf of others. Now, this is the first time that Jesus actually mentions something very important here. Give his life for others. He hasn't mentioned the whole substitutionary death thing. Not until here. But this is the first time, and he's going to mention it again before he dies, but that, that he is coming to, make, to pay a ransom or to give himself as a ransom, as the sacrifice. So Jesus, some people will say, you know, they argue about Jesus only came to be a teacher or to be an example. He came to give his life to pay for sins, and he acknowledges that. Verse 29, and as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. 
Right? As a result of that, Jesus gets to, um, he gets to illustrate his little sermon here. This lesson that he just taught them that I've come to serve, not to be served. In John 6, the people crowded around him after he fed the 5,000. They crowded around him and tried to make him king. Now see, if Jesus was just about getting popularity and prestige and goal accomplished, right? Done. But he put that aside. He's got, I'm not here for that. I'm, I'm, I'm here to do the will of my Father. So labor not for the meat that perishes, but rather labor, labor for doing the will of God. So now he's made this point. Verse 30, a blind man cried, or two actually. Verse 30, and behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. Now in, um, is it Mark's gospel again? You read there that this is Bartimaeus. He's one of the two. Matthew often does this. In Mark's gospel, he will zoom in and tell us about one particular man that's in the story. Then Matthew zooms out and says there were two of them doing it. Same thing with the maniac of Gadara. In Mark's gospel, there's one. But in Matthew's gospel, we find out there were two. Mark just focuses on one that stands out a bit more. Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. Verse 31, And the multitude rebuked them, saying, or, uh, because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still. Now, there's just two blind men crying out. right? This happens every day. Blind beggars on the side of the road. Now, if you're marching triumphantly into Jerusalem, Messiah, King, Son of David, here I come. Who has time for two meagerly beggars, you know? I just met meager beggars on the side of the road. Leave them alone. Get, but but that's, that's the people Jesus came to minister to. He's interested in them. Now, what do they have to offer him? How are they going to help out? The rest of the multitude is saying, shut up, shut up, man. Something bigger is happening here. But Jesus came to minister. Verse 32, Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? Now that's interesting. I love it when the Lord does stuff like that. Really, Lord, you need to ask? I mean, have mercy on I mean, here they are, they're blind. Have mercy on us, thou son of David. Oh yeah, what, what do you need help with? I mean, what do you think I need help with? I'm, again, you, you can see that I'm blind. But you know, the thing is, sometimes we don't know exactly what we need help with. How many times has somebody prayed, God, help me? They have no clue what kind of help they need. God, give me a job. No, you don't need a job. You need some character. Because if God gave you, gave you a job, one week later you'd lose the job because you're not a hard worker. You have no discipline. You don't show up on time. You leave early. You do a poor job while you're there. You don't need to pray, God, give me a job. God, give me character. <laughs> give me somebody to teach me how to be a man. <laughs> Right? That's a better prayer. So I, I, it's legitimate that Jesus gets specific and says, hey, what exactly are you asking for? I preached it a few weeks ago in church, but make your prayers specific. When you pray, I, listen, I'm all for our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I, give us this day our daily good. Pray the general prayers, but get specific with the Lord. Lord, I, I need this. I, I, I want to see that and have this conversation with him. Verse 33, they say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Now, guys, put yourself in this story. Just, just put, put yourself there for a second. I want to check something so I, I preach it correctly here now. kind of feel like I'm missing one fact there. Maybe one of you can fact check me on this, but I want to say Bartimaeus was born blind, but whatever the case, let me just preach it like that for a moment. You haven't seen anything. Nothing. You've only heard stories about this man that can open the eyes of the blind. You're a grown man. Let's put you 35. All your life, all you've ever done is beg, and all you get is the just the smallest amounts. Of, I mean, no one cared. They're all saying, shut up. And here comes, you don't know it, but it's the creator of, of, of the universe coming over to you. How many people do you think walked over to them and touched their eyes? I mean, who, who would do that? Jesus comes over and, how can I help you? 
That's a good question. How can I help you? Please, our eyes. Now, just close your eyes for a second and, and, and feel that hand coming on and touching. <laughs> it says, immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Now, now, think about this, guys. Just open your eyes and the first thing you see is Jesus standing there with his hand outstretched. I, that, that is an image, right, that is forever burned into your mind. So when we talk, when we sing about tur turn your eyes upon Jesus, the, imagine the first thing, boom, there he is, there he is. I, those kind of stories, and we know that it's physical sight, but if you're saved, surely you can understand this in a spiritual way. The first time you met the Lord, really, I, I grew up in a church. I heard all my uh, uh, adolescence, Jesus died on the cross, was buried, rose again. I, I knew that historically. I didn't understand how it helped me. But the first time I called upon the name of the Lord out of faith, asking him to save me because that's what I, I knew he offered it. And I felt that merciful hand reach out and wash away all my sins. And my eyes were opened and all of a sudden I, I see him in all of his glory. That's just something that sticks with you. And it's, I want to say it's hard, it's, it's impossible to forget the day you met the Lord. I, I, I talk to people all the time about that. You know, have you, have you asked Jesus to save you? Have you been saved? Are you born again? Eh, I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe. I say, have you ever met the president of the country? Well, no. I said, if you ever did, do you think you'd remember it? Yes. I mean, if you met Nelson Mandela, I don't care what you think about him. You'd remember the day you met him. I mean, we're talking about Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. You're going to say, oh, yeah, I, th I think I met him. <laughs> now, either you did or you didn't. <laughs> but either way, you should know that you've met him and that you've had your eyes open. All right, we'll stop there. Any questions on what we've covered there? Anything at all? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I know there's cases in the Bible that where it happened. I just I couldn't remember if Bartimaeus was that had that same situation. But yep. No, I, I wouldn't say so. Um, so just so it's on the record, she's asking the penny a day, could that be equivalent to eternal life? And Because they all get the same thing at the end of the day. But when you look at the context, Jesus is not explaining to his disciples how they get eternal life. He's explaining to them about their, their service and their motives for their service. Yeah. And even the parable itself, to say you have to go out and work in the vineyard, um, yeah, I, 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 just the context would tell me it's, it's more for service and not for salvation. All right, anything else? All good? Okay, next time around, right, no class next, uh, next Wednesday. Mark that on your calendars. I think Sunday, though, I, am I right? We've only had one Matthew exam. Is anybody ha keeping track of that? Woo, we'll catch up on that a little bit. So <laughs> I need to make up a little ground there, so... I can't even remember. I think we tested up till chapter 6 or 7. I think 7, right? I think I finished the Sermon on the Mount, gave you a test. Maybe 8. Okay. So I'm not going to test you all the way to chapter 21. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll shrink it down to a manageable portion. All right. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll head to the house tonight. Brother Alec, can you please close us in prayer?